Welcome back to another special episode of Risk Check Podcast. Tonight, we have a very special guest on the couch. We got my man Yoni from Material Good. Yes, yes. Very How excited. are you, sir? Very excited. <laughs> Welcome. I'm glad you <laughs> could join you. us tonight. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm really excited that you're here, too. Um, you're someone whom we followed for some time. And uh, we have a, lo a lot of love for Material Good. We got Thank a lot you. of love for you Thank and your background. You. Thank you. And I think this is going to be a fun one. Uh, but before we, we get into that, we obviously have to have our honorary risk check. Yes. And I am, I guess I got to start with the man who never repeats a watch. Rashawn, what do you got on the wrist? Okay. So this one is very interesting. So <laughs> is it? <laughs> that means he's repeating the watch. Yeah. I am that repeating the fifty-seven twenty-six. Yes, yeah. I am repeating the watch, but simultaneously wearing a new watch on the show. Oh, so okay. I'm double wristing. Okay. So um, I'm wearing, of course, the usual suspect fifty-seven twenty-six paddock on the custom John Russell strap, but I'm wearing um, the Timex Iron Man. Mm -hmm. um, Is that a, a James Brand collab? James Brand collab. As you guys know, I collect knives as well as pens and everything else. Um, a James brand knife is um, one that I carry every day. So don't get too close. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the, reason, <laughs> the reason why I decided to double wrist was because I kind of wanted, you know, with this episode, I wanted to kind of start um, from where I started to where I am today. I love that. Okay. Um, the Iron Man is my love affair for watches, and now being able to wear a paddock just like pff, blows my mind. So is this what we have to look forward to now? The paddock is going to stay <laughs> on, one wrist, on the left wrist, watch. and then you'll wear new watches on the on the right wrist? I don't know. I might have to go like, you know. I gotta, we got to have a word with Tristan. <laughs> ben, you That's gotta, my cheat code. You got a watch on. What are you, what are you rocking? I do now? have a watch on. The watch that everybody knows I'm probably already wearing. Uh Rusty, trusty, rusty, trusty, yellow, gold, Oyster Flex, Daytona. There we go. Um, the watch that keeps on giving. Yeah, literally so keeps good. on giving. It's so great. Don't stop ticking. It's so good. So yeah, I mean, there's nothing else I can really say about that I haven't said already. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing literally else that needs to be said. Don't take it off unless it's a special occasion or yep. dressed a particular way, and I want to give off a different attitude. I, I love it. But I mean, this, this I watch, totally get it. It takes how I feel. It, normally, it's like I feel like when people see this watch now, do you think of me? I think we got to take some like behind the scenes pictures of that thing and yeah. see how how worn it is. Now. Yeah, this thing's yeah, it literally looks like it's been a war. Yeah, uh, I'm wearing a watch I haven't worn in a long time. This evening, I'm wearing my Cartier Santos Dumont on the lime green Cartier strap. Yeah. Um, it's been sitting in the in the safe for a while, but I'm actually headed to San Francisco for a Cartier event, so I broke this one out. A couple days ago, wore it on Valentine's Day mm -hmm. and um, kind of fall in love with it again. There was a time where I was thinking about getting rid of it. And it was like last night I was with my wife and I was like, you know what? I'm glad I kept this thing. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And the strap. The strap the is strap really like, I was like, strap, damn, I love this. Hits. It took almost a year to show up. It yeah. did. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, Yoni, you got something special on tonight. You know, what do you got in the okay, rest? Okay. So I just want to start by saying I'm very excited to be here. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've been thinking about this. I've been planning what watch I wanted to wear. Uh, I, I said that I wasn't going to re repeat uh, a watch on this show. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I will say this. I thought that to take it a step further uh, from what you were talking about, about you know how you always have or often have very new watches, uh, I want. I actually got a watch and wanted to wear it for the first day. Oh wow! And oh, unveil wow. it on this show. That's awesome. Because, it's a new uh, watch alert. It's a new watch alert. New watch alert. Wow. A new moment with with real friends, and I I wanted to make it meaningful and create a memory with it. Yeah. So that's why I brought it. So I am wearing a uh, John Schaefer Woo! AP White Gold Perpetual Eve Klein. Beautiful. Blue. Two five eight seven zero BC, beautiful uh, from nineteen ninety nine, uh, with the crazy Eve Klein blue and and like the the old school perpetual and the Romans thirty two millimeter manual movement. I I love this oh, one. Oh no, shape case. Uh, too. That's right. Ultra that's thin right. is nice. Uh, and the story and the John Schaefer story mm -hmm. is like it's hilarious. I like it's such an interesting story. So, uh, is it is it worth mentioning? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so, it, so John Schaefer was an industrial American industrialist in the 1920s and 1930s, 
And in the early 1930s, he asked AP to make him a piece unique repeater mm -hmm. in this shape. Mm -hmm. And he noted that he had 12 letters in his name. So it's the 12 numerals just say John Shaver. John Shaver, I've seen so, this piece. <laughs> so AP creates in the 1930s yeah. a tonneau shaped repeater that just says John Shaver. Mm -hmm. Not, he was like a vice president of some company, not like a notable watch person. Yeah. Not, he was just like, I just want my name on a repeater from this brand. And mm -hmm. AP was like, okay, bet, let's do that. Yeah. yeah. Then the watch never sees the light of day. Yeah. And in the, I think, mid 80s to the late 90s, AP is like, we should use this beautiful shape case. So they create the repeaters. Mm -hmm. uh, they create the uh, wandering hour mm -hmm. repeaters mm -hmm. and perpetual calendars. So they they used it as kind of a platform for high complications. And very few of them, as I understand it, were made in this blue color. Yeah, and, I've never seen that before. Uh, yeah. And so I thought it was a, a really fun thing to to get to yeah. create a story with you guys. Well, what's the deal with the Eve's Climb blue too? How so, did that become a thing? So, uh, you know... Obviously, the, the artist um, kind of found his own Pantone for blue mm -hmm. and, and made this very, very kind of bold and unique blue. I think what's interesting about it, and I'm not a color specialist, so if I'm, if I'm wrong about the details, yeah, I, the comments I, get uh, you, I'm, I apologize <laughs> for, the, for the comments. Uh, but I think the, the cool thing about it is that the blue is unique to itself. There is no other blue like that. Right. And in the world and in, you know, experiencing nature to find a color or kind of a, a texture in some cases that has not been created by nature or by someone before is very rare so mm -hmm. to be able to create a color and es uh, essentially just create part of your branding around that i think is kind of special mm. um you know for brands have used it ap has used it several times right some perpetual royal oaks and and stuff like that what's so funny is i'm really are, hyped to wear this watch it's today. beautiful are you, are you, you gonna, gonna talk about, about yes yes right? yes yeah yeah <laughs> can you want to you want to tell sure, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll mention it so what's funny is we interviewed someone recently um shout out to our guy um michael graham michael graham from savant studios but uh, he was telling us about a time when he he was staying in Colombia, and he went to a um, it was like a little what do you call it? Just like a little like like a vendor's like a market. market. Yeah, it was like, like a, a market, market in uh, in Bogota. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of guys out selling watches, and there was one guy who had like twelve watches on these trays, and one of them had happened to have been a John Schaefer. The, the Wandering Hours repeater. That's To me, that's one of the greatest watches of all time. And the, the guy was uh, selling it for $200. And he, obviously. <laughs> no, he sold. He had just, fuck. He had just <laughs> bought a pair of sunglasses <laughs> at, at one of the other vendors and told the guy, he was like, I need this watch. You know, is it real? The guy's like, I don't know. He's like, I'll come back. Can I change it? Get your phone number? And the guy's like, I'm not giving you my number. You meet me here. He anyway, he went back and it was gone. Yeah. So he never got it. He never got but it. But could you imagine? Let me tell you about a, the story <laughs> of how I found a watch in Bogota that yeah. I never found. Uh, that is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that is nuts. Yeah. We looked it up while we were filming it. Yeah. I was like, I, what is that watch going one? now like, for? Quarter like million, no. quarter million. It's like oh. crazy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I thought it would be a, a cool thing to, to That's wear. That's awesome. Thank you. The case has two different finishes, too. It's it nice. does. Yeah. It does. Oh, satin on the side and, and the lugs and then uh, high polish. That's right. Bezel. That's right. So Reminiscent of um, something else that I do. Yeah. You, you mentioned there was a, a watch in Bogota that you were after. No, I was saying, like, I was the person who bought the John Jay. <laughs> oh, you probably were. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get into your story a little bit, sort of like your origin story. Um, you know, obviously we know you for who you are now, but prior to your work with Material Goods, you were in the you were in the advertising, like marketing business. I was. You're in digital I was, advertising. I was. I was the uh, I, I had two kind of career paths. I was uh the chief marketing officer of a large digital marketing agency. Mm -hmm. Um and I taught uh, in university as an advisor, mm. uh, where I was always the dumbest person in the room. Mm. Uh but I loved it and it, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I had collected watches and I had loved watches and I always wanted to get into the world. Uh, and you were collect, this is from like, you started collecting like years. Before. I started collecting when I was 16. So my mom got me a Hamilton watch when I was 16, wow. right after my stepfather passed away. 
I'm sorry. Uh, it's uh, and I put it. I've actually never told this story uh, to publicly before, but I'll be happy to share it. Uh, and it was meaningful to me because I, you know, I was going through grief, and I attributed all these things to it. Um, and uh, I put it on my right wrist because I thought if you are right-handed, you wear a watch. You put the watch on the yeah. side that you're on. Mm -hmm. Later, I would learn that that's incorrect. Mm. But I keep my watches, even though I'm right-handed. I keep my watches on my right wrist uh, as a reminder to always be there for my kids. Oh wow, that's awesome! Um, and and have a tad of them mm -hmm. here uh, because of that as well. So. Um, you know, that was my beginning. That was really my origin story with watches. And I fell in love with this object because I imbued it with so much meaning mm. uh, and still have it to this day. Uh, actually, my, my mom kept it because I probably would have left it yeah. like God knows where. Um, and, and that's kind of how I started collecting. And I was lucky early in my career uh, to be in a company that had an exit where I was uh, an early part of the company, uh, not enough money to be like very wealthy, but enough money to start a small watch collection. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not enough to buy a house, enough to buy a couple of pre-owned watches. Gotcha. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's kind of how I got the bug. And I started building and very quickly I got to meet this amazing community that mm. we're all a part of and I'm mm. sure we'll talk about tonight. Uh, and And that's kind of how it escalated. I always wanted to be in the watch world. I didn't really know exactly how or when I, you know, if, if, you know, one of the, my favorite four brands, Rolex, Paddock, AP, or Richard Mill asked me to like clean toilets, I would have done it. I would have, I just wanted to be in the building. Mm, mm. Uh, and when I was working in marketing, um, the U S president of Longa at the time, knew that I was looking for an AP. Mm. I was looking for a 153050R, which is the open work 39 millimeter uh, at the time on strap. Yeah. It had just been discontinued. Mm. And she was like, you should go to the store Material Good. Mm -hmm. It's very you. Mm. And they had just opened and you should see maybe if they have it. And I found the watch. Uh, actually, my friend Jeremy found the watch on the secondary market, and I was a little apprehensive at the time to buy it there. So uh, I I was in Soho, and I looked up and I saw the material good sign because there's no signage for the store. Yeah, and I was like, well, that's kismet. I'll go upstairs. Yeah. And I walked in and I met uh, the co-founder. I met both of them, Rob and Mike. But I, I spoke to Rob and I said, hey, this is the watch I'm looking for. Uh, it's discontinued. Uh, so if you have a pre-owned one. I'm not a pig. This is the number that I was. I saw it. Uh, I'll, I'm happy to pay that or a little bit more if you have it. Rob goes, wait a second. Goes in the back, pulls out one. Wow. He had a pre-owned mint condition one. Wow. Uh, I bought it on the spot, and that's how we kind of became friends. Uh, I would come and hang out there mm -hmm. from time to time. Still, you know, at that point, some of the brands started to pursue me to be head of marketing, mm. uh, but no brand that I had wanted to work with. So you uh, told Longa no. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I love Longa. I love Longa. I would never say that. Shout out to Wilhelm. Uh, so um, uh, you know, and so I was kind of trying to find my footing and you know, also deciding, and I think you guys probably have all experienced this, is do you uh, want to work in something that you love? Yeah. Because, it, you know, once you see how the sausage is made, it changes your yeah. relationship. It does. And, I, and watches, to me, were always an escape. Mm. And, I, and I spent a lot of time thinking, uh, is, do I want to break the wall of escapism? Uh, the answer was yes, and I'm very happy that I did. Mm -hmm. But it was, but it was something that I I thought about a lot. Uh, so I walked into Material Good one day, and was we were gonna have lunch, and I said to them, you know, what are you guys doing for marketing? And they were like, it's so funny that you should ask that. We were about to ask you the same. Thing. <laughs> wow. And they were like, why don't you put together a uh, marketing plan for us? And if it's good, we'll hire you. And you know, for them, they get a free marketing plan. For sure. me, I get a chance to work yeah, a somewhere that I like. that I want to do. So I put together a marketing plan. Uh, they hired me. Uh, I started working in marketing, and I think very quickly they realized that that's not where I should be. Mm -hmm. How long ago? And was this is 2016. Okay. Uh, so almost a decade ago. Wow. Uh, fuck. Um, <laughs> uh, so, how, how long were you just shopping there before you started working there? Like uh, two months. Okay, uh, got it. It was uh, we, we yeah. got oh, it was an instant click. <laughs> but but here, so here's what they did. So 
uh, Mike and Rob, the co-founders of Material Good, have many talents, truly many talents. One of their talents that I don't think that they even get enough credit for is they have an amazing eye for not only for talent, mm. but also for how to develop people into roles that may not seem the, like what they began with. So Interesting. I was so I was working in marketing. There wasn't a lot to market. Like Material Good was a growing place. We were building a website. Mm -hmm. We were just building social media. But we had AP and RM as authorized retailers at the time there. Mm -hmm. But AP and RM was starting the ascent. Right. right. And like there's I'm not going to teach these people anything about marketing. Uh, and so they started to say like, hey, so and so VIP is coming in. Why don't you help them? And I was like, okay, cool. And then, hey, so-and-so celebrity is coming in. Why don't you help them? And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, they do this for a couple of months, and I'm helping clients, and they're getting feedback. And then they call me into the office one day. And I'll never forget this. And Material Good was really starting to do well. At mm. And they said to me, they sat me down, and they said, when a company isn't doing well, do you know who the first person who gets fired is? I was like, oh, shit. Am I <laughs> uh, and they were like, we're, everything is good, but do you know who it is? And, they were, and I said, no. And they said, the head of marketing. I said, you know who the last person to get fired is? I said, no. They said, the head of sales. And they were like, you should be doing the sales. Mm -hmm. And my ego kicked in, but I'm a CM. They said, shut the fuck up. Yeah. You were born to do this thing, not mm -hmm. that thing. And I went home and I thought about it and I spoke to my family and my family was like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. You were born to do that. Right. So I was able to let my ego go, mm -hmm. come in and do that. We were one store at the time. We're nine stores now. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I am the head of watches for the brand and I have the best job in the world. I get to hang out with cool people mm -hmm. and see amazing watches and help some of my favorite people that I've ever known build historical and meaningful collections. Yeah. And I get to, you know, oversee the boutiques that we work with. Yeah. That's uh, incredible. So and I think the, the lesson is two parts. The lesson is uh, allow yourself the freedom to make changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the 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 universe provides. Mm -hmm. I, I wholly believe mm -hmm. that. And if you're so caught in one path, sometimes you, you don't allow yourself to see the opportunities that right. are in front of you. I think the other lesson is don't listen to your ego. Mm -hmm. Like just let that shit go. And and frankly, that's something that I constantly am am working on and need to work on more. Uh, but I think that that was a, an amazing way to start my career. Thanks it's, to it's an incredible Good. story. I think it's also important for us to kind of, you know, share with people what material goods sure. has become today. And we were talking a little bit about this off camera, but if you've never been to material good, it's important to know that this is not a typical watch retailer. As a matter of fact, it's more lifestyle mm -hmm. than anything. And it's it's not exclusively watches. You guys are doing home goods. Art, uh, art and furniture, jewelry, jewelry. Not, not so much furniture, not so much art, furniture, but and jewelry is a huge part of the business, both right. our own branded jewelry, uh, with a focus on like rare and large stones and, and really special stuff, uh, on the engagement and bridal side, mm. and also uh, brands that we carry, um, that that are you know both very established and up and coming. And you guys, but you guys, I think you guys do a really great job at uh, leading with experience, mm. yeah. And when you walk into material good space, you feel it. Like it just, it is like a weight that's almost lifted off your shoulders. It just feels like the kind of place you want to hang out at. That's, mm -hmm. that, that was the idea. Th thank you for saying that. And again, that's the brainchild of Mike mm. and Rob. And there's an amazing team at MG, at our Miami location, at our New York location, at our other stores that, that really makes that happen. But the idea was, you know, the... The only part of luxury that wasn't really luxury was retail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes retail felt very cold. It felt very transactional. Yeah. You have this, how much? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it also like a lot, there's a lot of like uh, mysticism and opaqueness where yeah. you don't know what something is worth. You don't know what you're buying. Um, and so the idea for Material Good was to build the clubhouse where people could come and hang out and sales are secondary or tertiary and it's about you know knowledge and conversation and relationships and you come and you have a drink and you hang out you buy you don't buy mm -hmm. it doesn't matter to us mm -hmm. uh you know if we give you a good experience we believe that eventually you'll come back to us no and i uh, and i think that's that's 
the root of it. I mean, so much of like a luxury experience can feel like sometimes from a consumer perspective that you're getting the short end of the stick. Yeah. Yeah. I give the money, I leave with the product and then yeah. Damn, what's what else? What did I really there? get? Yeah. <laughs> you know right. No but, memory, no. Yeah. Memory. But to create an atmosphere where people are like, no, I want to go and see these people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that is the magic. Yeah. It's the magic sauce. Do you have a question? No, because what I was gonna say was to to that point, you know, when you were talking about like the early inception of your career, um, and how you connected with um with the gentlemen, the the founders of Material Good you being a New Yorker, right? You kind of understand kind of like the secret sauce. Sure. You you know what it is. Sure. Mm -hmm. And when you kind of come in having so much of a cultural background, because we know you're a hip hop fan. Huge hip hop fan. We know <laughs> that, you know, that you're tapped into just like, you know, all things luxury. I think it speaks to the matrimony of what you guys were able to do and the experience that you bring. Because to Perry's point, I don't know how many stores I've walked into where I've wanted to buy from someone and I'm like, this guy just doesn't relate to me. Mm -hmm. This guy doesn't know. And it doesn't even matter what he looks like. Like, past that, they just don't walk the shoes I walk. Right. Why would I want to spend my money with you? Yeah. I, I've had to that point, I've actually, and I'm not going to name names. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had experiences with branded boutiques pre my career in the mm. watch industry uh, where I where the experience was so bad right. that I went home and sold my watch from mm. that company and never engaged with that company. Anymore. Right. Uh and and you know, I think oftentimes we forget in the retail space and in general, and when we're building these watches and creating these watches and creating the marketing and all that and telling the stories and, and making the content around them, that the salesperson is the front lines yeah. of the relationship. They have the they have in my opinion pr probably the hardest job or one of the hardest mm. jobs because they are the ones who are bombarded with the positive and the negative yep. and they have the absolute power of destroying or making a relationship. Mm. Yes. Uh, I had a, a client today that came to our boutique who shops at our Aspen AP boutique and he was just telling me how he's this huge paddock collector and he started working with us and that it's the like he's coming back to aspen because of the people right and like he he's seeking out the people I, I i'm obviously a big fan of your show and i recall you guys talking about going to the ap house which we're also mm -hmm. a partner of and saying that you didn't get any watches but you did have a good experience. Always have uh, a very, good time. Very I'm speaking for himself on that one. And, <laughs> on my watch. Uh, and like that, that is everything, you know, because you wonder, would people complain if they walked in and just got the watch? Would that be a good experience? And I and I think about that a lot sometimes. Like when when people go online, when people are speaking, when when collectors are having conversations, how much of the experience in their mind or the quality of the experience is wrapped in the transactional nature of it. Mm -hmm. So if you can tell someone no and have them leaving with a smile yes. or a good feeling, you've done something amazing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and also I can tell you that from all of my dating life that I've been <laughs> on the outside of that experience. Uh, so I think that that's, I think that that's really what we strive to do. And we're not perfect. You ask many people, they'll, or some people, they'll also tell you they hadn't had a good experience, not in, you know, you, you can't get it right all the time. You're not always going to hit a hundred. Uh, you're no. not at all. No. And, and you shouldn't pretend like you will. You should take onus of the mistakes, you know, learn from them. One of the things that we, when we hire people, one of the things that we talk about most is accountability. Mm. It's not about, are you going to make a mistake? Like I make many mistakes, probably more than most, but I try to take accountability from them, learn from them and grow from them. And I think accountability is something that's uh, missing often from luxury. I would agree. I mean, you know, the, the question is, do you have the capacity to take this negative situation and create something positive out of it? Mm, yeah. Um, Rashawn talked about you being, you know, he mentioned you being from New York. We know that, you know, we know you're a fan of hip hop. You mega. And you know, <laughs> this you, isn't you, a hip hop podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, um, what I loved about learning that ab about you is because you 
are a New Yorker. I am. I born in Israel, grew up in New York. You're in New York. Yes. I, right. And I, so, been here 30 years. Uh, you know, for us, and I, I want to get your take on it, but, you know, hip hop and watches go hand in hand. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Today, you know, we know that Jay Z is like the collector. Right. But I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, growing up as, as a young guy in New York City, loving watches, loving hip hop, who during that golden period were you looking at and be like, man, this guy's got it? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, that's an awesome question. First, I just want to say, like, I hate that I have to follow Nori. <laughs> like, for me, the only person who should ever... There's a couple of episodes between good, you two, good. but... I <laughs> but uh, for me, the only person who should follow Nori is Capone. And like no one else sure. should follow Nori ever. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously, Jay has become uh, something else. Like mm -hmm. he, he operates in rarefied air. I think him... Uh, I think John Mayer certainly mm -hmm. operates in, in that space and, and a few other people. Um, and um, growing up, I'm trying to think of like the first times where I, like the first, the first like rap lines I heard uh, with watches is like Biggie and Rolex. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. a lot of that. And then like, it wouldn't be till later that you hear like AP mentioned, mm -hmm. Uh, Paddock would come like much later, and, like past the golden age. From yeah, like by the time rappers were talking about Paddock, they weren't dope anymore. Mm -hmm. Not the Paddocks, the rappers. <laughs> uh, and like so, so uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, so like you said, the golden, the golden era. I'm gonna push back on you. Okay, how do you define the golden era? The golden <laughs> era for me. Uh, so there's only one answer, right? But let's. I'm, I'm gonna well, well. I don't want to like. I'm not. Sh I'm not sure what our age differences are. I'm 42. Okay, so I'm. I'm a little younger. So for yeah, me, pretty close though, still. Pretty close, but like for me, like <laughs> when I think, I know for you when you think hip hop, it's like 1992. No, no. Okay, no. so for me, it's like 96, 97. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Like 96, 97 is like well, peak. 94 is the greatest year of hip hop. Uh, cause like just, just from an album. Sure. I like, mean, ready to die. Ready to die. Crazy. Yes. Doggy style. Crazy. Yes. Um, I wasn't uh, even born yet. Like, no, he wasn't. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Rub it in. I, you think of rub it in. I, I think sucks for you. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, bro, Apple Music. Uh, I ain't missing that. <laughs> uh, and I'm from but, Brooklyn. I grew he up, missed too much. I grew like, up in some of the projects. Uh, Jay's dad's from there. Tompkins and Marcy. We one stop away from each other. So like, so you street. were around. I know. Uh, yeah. Trying to think of what like I'm blanking on other amazing like amazing. Thir I think 36 Chambers might have come out in 94. Yeah, 94 was a crazy like 94 year. 94 was a crazy year. But for me, the golden age of hip hop is like 94 to 2002. Sure. Or so because like I really liked the like Ruckus Records mm. era. Oh yeah, that was a great period in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Eminem for me mm -hmm. was a huge influence, um, and so uh, I think like that period is certainly it. Um, you know, it, I don't think that there was a ton of watch uh, n knowledge in hip hop in that period. Mm -hmm. I think that it would come a little bit after. I think that when you think of like people who really know watches in hip hop today, obviously you think of Jay, but sure. then uh, like Drake knows a lot about watches. Um I think it would, I think it'd and probably like, be safe to say that during that period, I mean, obviously it was dominated by Rolex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, and like and they were all small. They were all thirty six millimeters. Uh, which to yes. me is dates. like that's the way they're supposed me too. to be. Yes. Uh, For a day date, definitely. Uh, hearing you guys talk about pun and his and his flying saucer giant, bezel. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but like I had, a, I remember getting like a Techno Marine. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, with the like Fugazi diamond. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I ever felt till this day. I think I'm still chasing that high. Yeah. Of how cool I felt walking to a club in downtown yeah. New York. Yeah, uh, like there was a bunch of clubs in meatpacking, uh, and like with like a techno marine. I was like, that I made it, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> now I still have that watch, and like the gold paint has chipped off. Techno marine and, and bottle service bro. is all you need, exactly. <laughs> mm. Uh, so like, I, I remember that era. People would talk about Jacob, mm -hmm. um, yes. someone who I don't think 
uh, I think deserves more respect. I'm so glad you said uh, that. Yes, th- because that I feel gets, the same way. I, I think I he's think, getting it though. I think he's I, getting his, his respect so. now. I, I think, still don't think so. I don't think so because he does. I, I mean, in terms of like hot horology, like what this man has been able to produce, the like astronomia, he does crazy. What? Stuff. Yeah. I think I think it's because like the people who we want to see wear that stuff haven't worn it yet. That's right. Yeah. I think sure, they're still great, stuck on like well, not stuck, but it's more so like they think high horology and it's like. Crazy Patex and APs, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not That's so much point. Rolex, but crazy Patex and APs, RMs. They haven't gotten into the artistry of watchmaking yet. And yeah, where Jacob was, Jacob was making his insane. art. It's beautiful. Yeah, the, and the, the people don't look at his watch. And his yet. story is amazing. And I, I don't, I've met him a couple of times. I don't know him mm-hmm. very well, uh, but I can just speak to like the fact that I, I think that his story is awesome, uh, and how he started, how he started, and what he's built is amazing. I remember. Uh, hearing rappers talk about him, oh yeah, and, that, mm-hmm. and then I went and I got a five time zone. Yeah. Uh, oh god, I, I, I got one. a I got a five <laughs> time zone bape. Oh hey, wow, hey, uh, multi cam. Like, that's right. Uh, yep. the, I got the blue cam. Uh, five, you still you still have it? Uh, I don't. I, oh, and not because I crazy. sold it. I, I wanted to I uh, wanted to rock with the supreme one with the uh, removable diamond yeah, bezel. Yeah, like I th- I so like it's I think that that stuff is cool. I the five time zone was one of the first like uh, watches of a moment mm-hmm. yes. uh, and watches where hip hop had influenced other people. Yeah. Uh, Malika wrote an amazing piece mm-hmm. about it uh, in Houdinki. Yeah. Um, so shout out to her and, um, and, and that watch. Uh, I feel like I I lost the the question a little bit. It's all good. But I, I think hip hop and 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 watches. So I they think they do go hand in hand. Yeah, I was gonna I say, us, do you yeah. think the uh, the evolution of hip hop and watches comes with taste or with age? Oh, because wow. it seems like a lot of the guys, That's a, good question. a lot of the Excellent guys question. now, like like we're talking about Jay Nori, like Pun Joe. Back then, they were wearing what they were wearing, right? A lot of bust down, small right. Rolexes, big bezels, even Breitlings with big bezels, mm-hmm. whatever it was, all the aftermarket. And now the collections are more tailored, curated, more tasteful. And it seems like with a lot of younger artists now, they're still rocking Fugazi bust down Cartier, Cartier where they want to admit it or not. Yeah, that shit's Fugazi. What's the, what's no, it's your bust down is bust down and don't yeah, match the metal. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but then you still got a lot of like the older guys, like Drake, still very active. His collection is wild. wild. It's it basically crazy. all mm-hmm. factory, everything. Mm. I, I think I that's such a good question. Um, I think that it's two parts. I think that it has to do with hip hop maturing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the newer artists uh, benefit from the knowledge of ex- of fifty years of experience mm. before them. Uh, so they're not coming when they're even when they're sixteen or eighteen. Even if they're making the mistakes, there is an encyclopedia. Aside all, from yeah. you, oh. which is the real <laughs> yeah. Yeah. this is the real encyclopedia. We, I, we, we were saying, you guys said a new name. Yeah, yeah, like, go ahead, you bring like, it out first. I'm gonna bring it out and then I hope it sticks. It's, it, this one uh, might. It's catchy. But uh, <laughs> the watch wizard. There watch wizard. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> Just uh, three just syllables. Pure, pure Coin, <laughs> coined here. <laughs> coined here. It. Pure respect to the depth of knowledge. Uh, and I bet that you could quote bracelet references if you wanted. Just I'm not of, doing it. Out of, but out of respect for <laughs> That's you. That's too nerdy. Uh, so, but I think that they benefit from 50 years of there's, other there's people's a bedrock knowledge. of knowledge. That's right. And, and stuff I also exists, think yeah. that the way that information travels today allows people more access. Like a podcast like this that's much more inclusive and mm-hmm. caters to a much wider community mm-hmm. than than what was around previously. And I think that's why, uh, you know, what you guys do is so important. Thank you. Um, and, and I think that that's why so many people are galvanized around you uh, and believe in what you do, because what you're doing is important to the future of the culture of watchmaking. Yes. Um, and I think that that's, to, to answer your very good question, I think that that is part of uh, what hip hop has done now in the age of information you are you are able to learn if you want. Yeah, yep. I love that. Um, you had something. Well, because I, I I wanted to mention something. Um, when I think of you, right before you came on, right, I think of you as Yoni, like Mister Luxury. If I can give you an AKA, you 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 <laughs> I are think you named the episode. <laughs> <laughs> like you you are luxury, but to your luxury, right? When you think of all things luxury, I think of you. And then there's also. <laughs> but th- but there's I'm Happy there's a, Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you. There's a business acumen too mm-hmm. to what you do. Like there's luxury and then how you execute business. And you sat down with Jean Claude Beaver, mm-hmm. and I have to say that was absolutely the one of the best. Oh my god! 
Thank like you. talking watches, like Hodinky kind of like esque. It was very good. It, it was it was oh, one of the best. Yes. But also too, you spoke to marketing or at least partnering with Jean to talk about um marketing, but then it was the business side. Mm -hmm. And you know how he capitalized on um Blanc Pan. Going to buy it from, I think it was twenty eight thousand Swiss francs to like selling it for whatever, <laughs> yeah, whatever he wants. Twenty to forty million. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Depends on who you ask. So I wanna, I wanna ask, how are you able to capitalize in that space where not only do you um, kind of leverage yourself, but then also take it to executives, boardrooms, etc., oh, and do that. That's awesome. Thank you, first of all. Uh, I think that first, uh, you, you need to give credit, mm -hmm. right? So like Material Good, Mike and Rob, the people there have given me, have set me up for success in a major way. They've put me in a position to win. So I think that acknowledging what they have done mm. and what they built before me, uh, I think is really important. My take on it, um, has always been like Humphrey Bogart talks about this thing with acting. Someone asked him like, what, how are you such a great actor? And he said, I just look people in the eye and tell them the truth. Uh, mm. and I took that idea and I try to apply it to what we do. So to me, luxury, people have a misconception of what real luxury is. They think that it has to be expensive. Mm -hmm. They think that it has to be fancy. I think luxury, uh, did you, was that a, a quiet <laughs> real sneeze? Yeah. <laughs> what? Practice, baby. That was the craziest sneeze sneak, I've sneak, ever sneak, heard in my yeah. life. Sneak, or sneak. not heard. Uh, I think that real luxury, I was like about to drop a, a yeah, jewel. Like, my man with the uh, silence. Uh, so I think that real luxury uh, uh, is two ideals coming together. One, it's where beautiful items meet supply chain. And mm. I think that that's something that people often miss is the supply chain part of it. Because, you know, if it is easily accessible, I would argue that by definition, it can't be luxury. Mm -hmm. uh, there has to be some kind of a barrier with luxury. Right. Uh, and the other part of it is luxury isn't fancy. It is um, authentic, right? So it's stripping something down to its most authentic self and then adding a beautiful object to it. And so luxury can be a meal. Luxury yeah. can be a conversation. Luxury can be the interior of a car. Luxury can be a watch. Luxury can be a bottle of wine. Luxury can be something as abstract as stitching, mm. right? So if stitching, if something as abstract as stitching can be luxury and artisan, that means that there has to be a human element to it. And if there's a human element to it, then it can be stripped down to an experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that luxury at its core is that. And I think that sometimes we forget that there's, you know, obviously the barrier is money. Yeah. Um, and that is, and that, and that is a part of this world. Pretending like it's not is, is wrong. The, you know, when you speak about many of these brands and when you get to the higher end of luxury, uh, the, the cost of goods plays a role in it. Mm. Is it a fair uh, discussion to, to say, is the cost of goods justified? That's a totally fair discussion. Yeah. But to say that the cost of goods isn't there is not because they, they exist. These things are expensive. If they should be that expensive, it's another question. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that to be able to sit with these people like Jean-Claude, who's a, a mentor and a, and a dear friend um, and other amazing CEOs and heads of brands, I think it goes back to that idea of just look people in the eye and tell them the truth. Yeah. And if, and if you do that, you never have to pretend. Mm. And I think that that's part of giving people a luxury experience. I feel that I say to my clients, don't buy this a lot more than I say buy this. Yes. Right. Uh, you were talking about Tristan, right? And like, who's an amazing person mm -hmm. who I was recently introduced to and our, our text messages, uh, and you can ask him this, half of our text messages is me telling him, don't do it. Ben does that a lot too. He, 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 sometimes uh, he comes and what to an amazing guy. Yes, he's awesome. Uh, yes. And so, and so I think that that's luxury. Yeah, it is. I think that giving people honest opinions and feedback is part is kind of maybe a more a amorphous idea of luxury, but luxury is experience. It's the only thing that separates 
uh, like a McDonald's burger, cheeseburger, which is amazing. Mm. And the burger at um, at Fort Charles is the ingredients and the experience. Right. Uh, and and I think that that's what it goes to. Uh, so I don't know if that fully answers the question. It's fantastic. But, yeah. uh, to me, that's kind of how it's I It's a lot of game it. there. There is a lot of game. <laughs> I have... Uh, forever. I don't know if you need <laughs> uh, we, I have I have one last question for you. Uh, uh, that's it? We're almost done. No. <laughs> I refuse. That just means there's a part two coming. I, there you go. Yeah, I we got to bring you back. Anytime you want. Um, but, you know, our friend here, Rashawn, brought up uh, your interview with Jean-Claude Duvert. And we know recently he has uh, partnered with his son mm -hmm. uh, to launch the family brand. Mm -hmm. And they're working with Material Good. They are. We're the exclusive U.S. Um, distributor of the brand. What has that relationship been like for for you personally? For you know, we're being able to work with this legend, um, and and this is sort of uh, how do I articulate this? This is, I mean, for all intents and purposes, this is like his last hurrah. This is his legacy mm -hmm. that he's laying down. He's doing it with his son. What's it like to be part of that? They've released some monster pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, can you give us some insight in terms of sure. what's to come and, and what the partnership means for sure, you guys? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I, I want to first encapsulate it with speaking about independence mm. and my love of independence. Yeah. I've been collecting Jorn uh, since, I don't know, like 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the brand. MBNF and Max, to me, make some of the most amazing and interesting watches. Uh, H. Moser yep. is another brand that I love. Material Good will actually be carrying them in Dallas. Uh, awesome. in, uh Sorry, in uh, Miami. Incredible. Um, and so I'm very excited uh, about that. And, um, you know, Jean-Claude has always been a friend, and I got to meet Pierre a couple years ago. Now, I don't know how much time you guys have spent with him, but Pierre, first of all, Pierre is very young. He, when I met him, I think he was 21. Mm -hmm. Now he's 23. Wow. Uh, and he's amazing. He's an amazing person. And he's an amazing, he's one of us. He's a watch nerd. He cares so much. He's, he's antithetical to his father and mm -hmm. his approach, uh, which is why I think they complement each other so mm -hmm. well. Uh, Jean-Claude is so enamored with the story and the experience and the emotion. And Pierre is so technically savvy mm. while also having an eye to the to the to the marketing uh so pierre wants to work with like the greatest watchmakers and find new and innovating uh innovative complications and so getting to work with the two of them is really interesting because you see these the opposite parts of their career pierre is in his ascent right. and 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 jean claude is in his last chapter the of the plan, yeah. right um and and so it's cool to get to be a part of that moment and it's a big honor for me for material good but for me as well as someone who loves watches i think that um people i i think that this will age very well what i'm about to say okay uh, but <laughs> we, we'll find out together but <laughs> i believe that um uh, people will be amazed at the career that pierre ends yeah. up having ha having uh, because I believe that he's going to have a very long and meaningful career yeah. in, in, in the watch world. So, you know, getting to be a part of that and getting to see their direction and having some insight into the things that they're doing in the future, they are not going to rest on the, the name, mm. you know, uh, someone, someone said, and they articulated this as well, like the Bever name gives you a couple of years. Yes. Uh, but that's it. Mm. Uh, after that point, you need to produce yeah. some real bangers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I think that they are highly cognizant of that. Yeah. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun uh, getting to work with the, the Moser team in Miami for Miami for we just opened Material Good Miami in December. That's really exciting. I'm a huge fan of independent watchmaking. Uh, and you know, the two things that I'm really focusing on now, obviously our relationship with AP, uh, and, and with Richard Mill and with those brands, but, uh, I want to continue to, uh, speak about and elevate the independent watchmaking space. And also, um, this is a little corny, uh, but I, <laughs> but I will say it, uh, cause you guys make me feel safe. <laughs> uh, but, um, I think that we need to bring some love back into the community. Yeah, uh, I think that there is a lot of negativity mm. uh, digitally, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that people 
are really quick to rush to opinions. Uh, you know, they see a watch and they're like, I like it, meh, I hate it. Yeah. And it's like, they don't know that, you know, a watchmaker and a designer spent five years and this is their baby yeah. and they're putting it out in the world and a watchmaker spent, you know, six months making it mm -hmm. and everyone is so proud and then they put it out and sometimes it hits and sometimes it doesn't and that's okay. But mm -hmm. I think the way that people consume information should reflect the space in which we're in and watchmaking is not a quick space right not creating it not making it not marketing it not releasing it not selling it mm. and we forget that in this disposable world that these are these are forever objects and i think that and this is not a new thing you know it happened when the royal oak was released in 1972 that people made quick dis, you know opinions of it and then they shifted gears same with the offshore yeah. same with the code yeah. i was i was there for that mm. um but i do think that our space we should really focus on bringing uh more thoughtfulness and positivity into the into the conversation i may get skewered in the comments for that <laughs> uh but i'm but i'm okay with that because i do think that it's important and one of the things that i love about what you guys do so much is that because it's so fresh and relatively new you're 70 something episodes in but because it's so fresh that people are still like uh, on the positive with you. I see the comments and the comments are so overwhelmingly positive and supportive and it and in, it, it excites me. Like mm. it, it ignites an energy in me to see that that type of culture is still out there. And and I think that that's something that I personally am focused on and trying to, you know, spread that message as, mm. as corny as it's like. No, I think that's great. It's poignant. Yeah. Man, I'm 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 sorry we have to end this. I don't want to go. <laughs> when you guys start your next in a week, when you come back, I'm just gonna be sitting there. We're definitely gonna have to bring you back. I'd, I just want to say, um, you know, it's been a privilege to have you with uh, us this it's an evening. Honor. Um, I, I I don't want this to end. I really enjoyed it. Me but, too. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank we you. We appreciate you, my thank brother. You. Watch Wizard. Give you. Over here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Watch Wizard. <laughs> the Watch Wizard. Uh, for those of you watching and listening, you know where to find us, uh, riskcheckpod.com, riskcheckpod on Instagram. Uh, maybe the metaverse. No. Maybe no. one day the they, metaverse. They got the, they got the... We're on Spotify, <laughs> the works. Uh, check out Material Good. Please. Please. Come hang uh, out. If you're in New York, be sure to visit. You can or Miami. online, Miami. Yeah. Where else? Uh, and Instagram. Uh, yes. We have uh, four AP boutiques uh, yep. in Boston. Dallas, the meatpacking house, and um, and Boston, Dallas, meatpacking, and Aspen. And Aspen. Uh, I'm going to get killed. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and Aspen. That AP house in uh, Aspen is newer, no? Uh, it's, so it, it, AP in Aspen is a boutique, mm. uh, and the AP house is uh, here in meatpacking. But certainly come visit us in, in our locations and Please hang do. out. And uh, and share the story and uh, it's been an honor. The, my only fear of coming back is that I now need to get a new. A new one. Gotta, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna or go, you go just broke. Double risk like I'm gonna go guy. broke real quick being a, yeah. a recurring guest on your. Show. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, you again, guys. my man. Really, Appreciate thank you. you. It's an honor. Yes, and we'll see you guys. Deuces. Peace. Peace.